name is Dr. James Riley of the Bethesda Church of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Today, we're going to be studying the book of Jeremiah in the second chapter. And before we begin, let us start with a, word, a moment of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you, God, for allowing us to be here today. Well, God, we ask you as we begin this study that you would open our minds, God. Father, that we would be free and clear to understand your word. Lord God, we ask you to open our ears, God, that we will be able to hear from you. And Lord, we ask you to open our hearts that we might be receptive, Father, to understand your word, Father, and hear the Spirit of God minister through this text. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Starting in Jeremiah chapter 2, starting at verse number 1. The word of the Lord reads this way. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Well, God is telling Jeremiah, in verse number two, he says, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. That word cry in this particular text means to go and preach, go and tell the people, go and cry out to Jerusalem saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth. What awesome words to remember. Uh, when the Lord says, I remember thee. What awesome words to hear as a believer and to know that the Lord remembers us. He further goes on to say, I remember the kindness of thy youth. The word youth here does not mean age. The word youth means the beginning of the relationship the youthful relationship that God had in the beginning when he first fell in love with us and we first fell in love with him. He says the love of thine espousal. And what God means here is there is a marriage that happens between God and the believer. That marriage happens when we accept him as our Lord and our Savior and he comes to live down on the inside of us. It is literally like a marriage. He says, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. God wants them to understand there was a newness, there was a freshness, there was a lot of um, not understanding the plan of God in the beginning, but they went and they were happy to go simply because God told them, go. This is where I'm sending you. This is what God wants to tell us on today. That there was a freshness, a newness. There was a uh, relationship like a brand new marriage when we first began to get to know God, to learn the promises of God. Our prayer lives were new. We were excited to talk to God when we woke up in the morning. We were excited to talk to God all throughout the day. We were excited to share our faith with others. And before we went to bed at night, we always wanted to make sure that we closed our day out in prayer. God wants us to go back to the times when we first loved him. God wants the children of Israel here in the text to return back to him with that same youthful joy that they once had in the beginning. It says in verse number three, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. This part in verse number three, God was reminding Israel that in the beginning, they were holiness unto the Lord. They lived according to what he told them. They did what he told them to do. Now God is saying, uh, with the first fruits of his increase, meaning that they did not slight God that they gave the way that God told them to give. 
they presented their offerings the way that God wanted them to present the offerings. He says, anybody that offended Israel, God repaid them with his vengeance because he loved Israel. He loved Judah. He loved the way that they praised and worshipped him. So he did not allow any other country, any other people to come and do any harm to Israel because they were his people. And verse number four reads, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and become vain. What God is saying in verse number five is, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? What God is saying by iniquity is saying, what kind of problems have they found with me? What promises have I not kept? When I promised you something, how many times did I not come through with what I said that I would do? God is asking the children of Israel now, uh, have you found any problems in me? Uh, God is further goes on by saying, not only uh, have I kept all of my promises, but I need to know from you, why did they leave and walk after vanity? The word vanity is simply sin. He wants to know if I have not done anything wrong, why would they leave me and walk after sin? God is asking us the very same question today. What is it about loving me that will cause you to leave me and walk after sin? What is it that I've done to you that you don't believe that I can continue to sustain you, to keep you, to keep loving you? God is asking the world, he's asking Christians all over the world, what have I done to make you lose trust in me? He says in verse number six, neither say they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. The question God is asking them is simple. Have I ever left you? Have I ever allowed you to go hungry? Have I ever allowed you to not have something to drink? God is saying, am I not the same God that brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt? And I made sure that their clothes didn't tear up. I made sure that their shoes didn't fall off of their feet. He's saying simply, I'm still the same God. He is assuring them, I'm the same God. I have the same power. I'm able to do the same things I did for them. I'm able to do for you. In verse number seven, he goes on to say, and I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. This is really the center point of God's aggravation with Israel. If you want to know why God is mad, if you want to know why he's upset, if you want to know why Israel is going to enter into captivity, verse number seven tells us why. God is upset because he's saying, I've done everything that you've asked me to do and more. He says this, I brought you into a plentiful country. I brought you into a land that was flowing with milk and honey. You had everything you wanted to eat. You had everything to help you live a comfortable life. He says, but when you entered into the land, 
that took 40 years to get to, you immediately began to defile the land that I gave you with rituals to other gods, to believing in idol gods, to carving wooden images. God is upset because he's saying, I kept my end of the promise. But when you entered into that land, you did not keep your end of the promise. So God says, the thing that I, I left for you, the heritage, what a heritage is, is what a father leaves for his children. It's a portion of land. It's a house. It's a car. It's money. It's everything that child would need to continue living at a certain level, even after their father has moved on. God is saying, I left a heritage to you, but you turned it into an abomination. And what an abomination to God is something that he does not want to deal with. An abomination is something that God cannot tolerate and will not tolerate. God says, you have turned my land into a place that I do not want to inhabit. I do not want to live in this place with you anymore because you begin to offer up offerings to other gods. It literally made God sick to see what was going on with the Judah. Now he is raising up a young prophet in Jeremiah to go and proclaim this message of God's disgust, his anger, and his hurt to his chosen people. God says this in verse number eight. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied for Baal and walked after things that do not profit. If there's a verse that I want to share with you, if there's a verse that I want to beg of you to preach with great conviction, it starts with us. God is telling Jeremiah, uh, you can't preach to the people without first examining yourself. You cannot preach my word to the people without first knowing that you have to have a clean heart. Knowing that you have not done everything that I have required or called you to do. He starts off in verse number 8 by saying, The priest said not, where is the Lord? Jeremiah had to understand that this was a fourfold problem. There were four levels that God wanted to explain to him. The first level was with the priest. We all know and we will be taught that the priest came from the tribe of the Levites. The Levites' responsibility was to inform the king of everything that God had to say, making sure that when the people came to bring their offering to God, that it was prepared the right way, that God would receive the offering and forgive their sins. But what Jeremiah had found out from God is, God was no longer pre pleased with the priest because the priest was not keeping him first. He further says, and the ones that handled the law knew me not, meaning he did not expect for the government to be the ones keeping up the religious practices. He said that the people who kept the law did not even know who he was because the priests were not making it a point to make sure that they kept teaching the traditions of their forefathers. He says the pastors also transgressed against me. He's saying even the pastors, those who are over the flocks, who are over the people, even they were sinning against God. The very people who were supposed to proclaim the word of God to all of the house of Israel, even they were sinning against God. Isn't it a terrible time when the people can't even count on the pastors to hold fast to the word of God? It's a terrible time in Israel. And God further goes on to tell them, and the prophets prophesied for Baal. 
Baal was an idol god. Baal uh, was the other god of the mountains. When the people went to worship Baal, uh, in other words, they wanted something different from God. They felt like God was being too hard. He was requiring too much. So they began to go worship Baal, who was a god that the Egyptians worshipped. What a terrible thing to go back to, to leave the only true and living God to go worship an idol god in Baal. And he said that the priest, the pastors, the law keepers, and the prophets walked after things that did not profit. Isn't that an amazing revelation? That everything they did made God sick to his stomach. The pastors, the priests, the prophets, and the lawmakers all had God angry. So God tells Jeremiah this message in verse number nine. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, said the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. God's saying, I'm going to give your generation and future generations an opportunity to repent and come back to me. In verse number 10, he says, For pass over the isles of Cheatham and see, and send unto Kedor, and consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. What God is telling them is I need you to go over to the other lands that surround you. I need you to go to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And see if they have half of the things which I've blessed you with. God needs them to understand. That I am the only true and living God. And there will be no other God that can do the things for you that I have done. Now as we further continue this study. In the next verses you'll see that God is now angry. God is trying to pass a message to Israel. That he is not going to tolerate what they continue to do. He's not going to tolerate the sin. He's not going to tolerate uh, them going to other gods. He spells this out for Jeremiah this way in verse number 11. Hath the nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doeth not profit. God is saying, is there another country that have left their idol gods to go find another God, which really is no God. They're worshiping uh, what they think a God is, something that they've created with their own hands. God's saying, but that's not a God at all. God is saying, but my people, those who I love, those who I have called, God is saying to them, how can you leave me, a God who's done everything for you, to go worship no God at all? God further tells them in verse number 12, be astonished over ye heavens at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye desolate, saith the Lord. In verse number 12, he's just saying, it's time. If you ever wanted to be scared, now is the time to be scared. If you wanted to fear me, now is the time to fear me. In verse number 13, he says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God says this, you forsaken me, you have turned your back on me. I'm the God of living water. He says, I am the God that gives you everything you need. He said, and you've turned from me and tried to create your own fountain. But your fountain has cracks. Your fountain has holes. Your fountain can't.
can't even hold water. This is exciting news for me and the reason I'll tell you why. God is saying that in and of ourselves, we can do nothing. Everything that we create, everything that we try in our own power, it will fail. But God is the only true and living God. And in him, we can put all of our trust. He is the living water. He is our source for all of our needs. And God wants us to know, depend, and lean on him for everything. God now begins to tell them here in verse number 14, is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? God is saying, you're my children. You're not servants. You're not slaves. So why are you acting that way with me? Why are you acting like I have you in a captivity or a holding cell? God is saying, I've given you everything you need. Why are you acting like I'm the bad guy? Why are you acting like I'm the one who has been hurting you? God is asking us the very same thing today. Why are we acting like he's the enemy when he's really the only one who can help us through our trouble? In verse number 15, he says, the young lions roar upon him and yell. And they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitants. God is saying that the young lions, all they did was roar. They made a lot of noise. And when they did that, it, it made their land a desolation or a place that no one could live. God is saying, at the very image of another God, you turned away from me. You walked away from me and trouble was really not there. It looked like trouble. It sounded like trouble, but you didn't trust in me enough to stand your ground and trust me that I would be your God. It says in verse number 16, also the children of Noph and those of Tathapan had broken the crown of their head. Has thou not procured this unto thyself, and that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way? He's asking them a question. Have I not proven myself to you? He says this in verse number 18. And now, what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt to drink the waters of Shahor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria to drink the waters of the river. God says, why do you look to all of these other lands when I've given you everything you need? In verse number 19, thine own wickedness shall correct thee and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. And that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. God wants Jeremiah to tell them that the people no longer fear God the way they once did. In verse number 19, God said, it's going to be your own wickedness that is your disciplining rod. It is going to be your own wickedness that is your downfall. And God is telling us that today. It's not what the world is doing that's hurting the church. It's not what the world is doing that's causing us to turn away from God. But it's our very own doing that is tearing the very fabric of Christianity away. It's because we refuse to do what God is calling us to do. It's because we refuse to do what God is telling us to do. It says in verse number 20, for of old time, I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands. And thou sayest, I will not transgress. When upon every high hill and under every green tree, thou wanderest, playing the harlot. God now intensifies his conversation. God tells them, look, I have to be straightforward with you because I need you to understand what I'm saying. In verse 20, he says, I destroyed the yoke of slavery off of you. 
I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I freed you. With my own hand, I destroyed the yoke of Pharaoh. I am the one who pulled you out of pits, making bricks without straw. With my own hand, I sent my servant Moses to take you away from the land of Egypt. But look at you now. Now that you've been free, now that you have access to everything that you've been doing. Look, he said this all by yourself. He's saying by yourself, you've transgressed and you have begin to act like a harlot, like a street walker. God said you have perverted everything that I've given you. And now you're acting like everybody else. Look in verse number 21. He says, yet I have planted thee a noble vine. What this means is God is saying, I've put you in a fertile place where you can grow and be everything that I've designed you to be. He says, holy a right seed, meaning that you are not trash weed. You are not just something that was sprouting up out of the ground that was not going to produce fruit, but you were a right seed placed where he wanted you to be. He says, how then art thou turned into a degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? God is asking a question that's sincere to his heart. I planted you to produce fruit that I would be proud of. How is it now that you've turned into a weed, something that is undesirable to me, something that I don't even want? This is what God is said, telling us today. God wants to know how is it that I've given you access to everything you need. And God wants to know now, why are you silent? God wants to know, why are you not preaching what I'm telling you to preach? The way that I'm telling you to preach. God wants to know, why have you turned away from me after I've done so much for you? In verse number 22, God says this. For though I wash thee in a nitri and take thee much so, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith God. Simply what God is telling us today. God is saying that I've prepared a way for you to be cleaned up. In the way that I've told you to prepare your offering to me, it would have cleansed you. I've brought you a lot of soap. He said, but it is your sin. It is your transgression that has marked you with a mark that can't be cleaned up. God wants to know, why is it that I've given you so much but you decided to put a mark, a stench on yourselves that I can't be pleased with. I can't overlook it. So God's saying, this is what I have to do now. Now I have to give you a penalty for what you've done. You're sinning. You're sinning and you know you're sinning. And you refuse to turn back to me. So because you refuse to turn back to me, I have no choice but to bring my vengeance upon you as I've done so many others. Look, in these first two parts of chapter 2 of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is receiving a plan from God. And that plan from God is he needs to tell them there is only one way of escape. There's only one way that you can get back into God's good graces, and that's to repent. Repentance is the key factor in everything that we preach. Look, this is what we need to do. We need to explain to them what repentance is. Repentance in its smallest, simplest form is stopping doing what you're doing now. To stop doing what you know is sin to God and to turn around Accept him as your personal savior. How do we do this? We confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart. We believe that Jesus was God's only son. 
We believe that Jesus sent his son to die for our sins. We believe that God raised Jesus from the dead three days after he got off the cross. We believe that Jesus is now seated on the right hand of the Father, praying for us every day. That is repentance, saying, God, I, forgive me. I realize I need a Savior, and what I'm doing is going to send me to hell. So I receive your son Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, and I will not sin against you the way that I've been sinning. Look, this is a very important text that we have to continue to preach to the body of Christ, that they begin to understand what God's plan is for us, what God wants us to do in the coming days. Understand this. It is the plan of God that none of us would perish, that none of us would die, but all of us that will receive the free gift of his son, Jesus Christ. In the Old, in the Old Testament, they had to sacrifice an offering. In the Old Testament, they had to go to the priest. The priest had to prepare the offering, and the offering had to be accepted by God. How God would accept the offering is he would send fire down from heaven and consume the offering. That offering would only be offered up once a year, and that offering would cover the sins of the entire people for that year. Look, simply put, God wants us to come back to him and have a relationship with him the way we did when we first accepted him. Look, this has been a very interesting study. And as we conclude in this part two, make sure you understand that God wants his people to come back to him.